Oh, John, John Kurz, you mentioned something about the, the, the limitation of self-reporting in, 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 in uh, when, when trying to identify shocks and, and so on. Can you tell us maybe some way that these uh, sets reporting issues can be tackled, maybe by using secondary data, some, <coughs> some practical example on this? Yes, but first I want to follow up on something that Dan said. Um, <laughs> So he was talking about multiple shocks and uh, how, how we need to look at those and how they combine. Um, I think one thing we need to be careful, Dan would never do this because he's much more intelligent than me, but people like me would take that and say, okay, we are gonna lump them all together and more shocks equals you know, worse on a, on a nice e index. And we would you put that in our models and say, you know, okay, what are the key factors then that, you know, that predict whatever outcome when you had such and such amount of shocks? And I think, going back to some examples that you've drawn before, it, look, the, those capacities or those factors <coughs> that are going to make a difference are really going to differ based on what the shocks are. So, you know, drought, there's certain characteristics that are going to make you more or less resilient to drought than it would be a food price spike or conflict. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to, yes, understand that they are, you know, they do exacerbate each other, but at the same time, n not lumping them all together in an analysis, which I've done. In, <laughs> uh, secondary data, I, I'd actually like to hear from the, the participants. I mean, there's a lot of people working in, on the technical working group in the audience and, and elsewhere. Um, to me, it's one of these things where the answer seems obvious. There's NDVI data out there, and, and it's at a resolution that we could probably match with household survey data that we collect or DHS data um, to look at, you know, change in precipitation levels or biomass or whatever is out there in, in terms of uh, you know, secondary environmental variables. Could be conflict. There's a good armed uh, conflict incidents databases now that you could use to look at exposure to conflict potentially that, you know, we probably get around some of the self-reports, especially when it's a sensitive issue like that. You know, personally, I, it's, it's still kind of just an idea. I've, I've not been s successful in doing that. So maybe to the group there, is there an example where uh, you know, we've taken an environmental variable and really merged it with a household data set to be able to do that kind of analysis of how do this a system level factor mm -hmm. uh, affect what's going on at a household or community level. This is more of a question, um, but uh, crop fertilization is retarded if you, with increases in heat, and that will obviously affect yield. You get more legumes growth and less grain yield. Um, um, just to repeat, to <coughs> just to repeat, so that, um, crop fertilization is retarded uh, with increases in heat, and so therefore you get less grain yield and more leguminous growth. Obviously, we make more use of <laughs> the grain yield, I, either directly or um, or through livestock consumption, and so that <coughs> I, I guess that would be a source of secondary data that is. Uh, validated through agronomic research, and you can probably get the same kind of thing with uh, the application of, of water and, and uh, both in dry drylands and in irrigation situations. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that would be one comment. There's lots of agronomic and hydrologic research out there for that purpose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Then, then I think we'll, we'll come back on, on some of the questions.